Cool. So, um, first of all, thank you very, very much for putting on this event. Um, foolproof for having hosting everyone. And thanks to the sponsors of Future Head. And of course, Chris and the team. Um, and of course, all of you lovely people for being here. Um, it's great to see so many of you here tonight. Um, and I can't imagine I'll be able to teach you much as you're all experts in what you do. So I wanted to have an informal chat about the, some of the things I've learned about our product over the last few years. But I wanted to start by telling you a story about when we got our first booking and about how, and about how things didn't necessarily go to plan. So just to set the scene, my name's Joe and I'm co-founder of Datemakers. Uh, Datemakers is a date experience platform. So our new website was live. We were really, 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 really excited and we worked hard to get it there. We'd worked hard to get it live and we were working around our part-time jobs just to make sure that we could get a product out there that people could actually use. So we decided to do a Facebook Live of the launch of the website. And for some bizarre reason, we thought the only way we could live stream on Facebook was with our phone propped up on an ironing board filming a laptop screen with a new website on. Anyway, we got, we, got, we got everything live and we had a few pretty cool experiences on the website. We had an alpaca farm tour, glass blowing, comedy nights. Although our first booking was from a ukulele instructor. It was a ukulele lesson where the instructor would come to your living room to teach you how to play the ukulele. We were celebrating, we were jumping up and down. We thought, yes, this is great, this is good. Our first booking, we're onto something here. And it's a quirky one too, which is even better. So we got, on the, uh, we got the phone call from the ukulele instructor who shared the same experience as us. Sorry, this, the same, same excitement as us. Guys, I've got my first booking, he said. We were like, yeah, we know, log in and accept your booking. There was a pause on the end of the line and he said, I don't have a car, how do I get there? So I picked him up and drove him an hour to the date and, waited, <laughs> and I waited around the corner for two hours and then drove him home again. So it's safe to say this isn't exactly how we planned it and there's definitely a few learnings from this. So I'll come back to that in a little bit. But by show of hands, I wanna know who here has been on a really great date, like a really, really good one where you leave and you're like, yeah, that was good. But I don't wanna know about the person, I wanna know about the experience. So can someone tell me like what the best date experience they've ever been on? Not the person. Someone over here put their hand up. Volunteers? Anyone? Back? Um, so she decided to kind of surprise the whole thing. Yeah. Um, she was like, meet me at this location. I'm not going to tell you any more information. Um, and then just plan the entire day. What do you think about secret dates, surprise dates? Uh, I'm down with it. Yeah, down with it? She didn't even look cool. And what, sorry, what, what was it in the end? <laughs> <laughs> what was it? Cool, so merge a few things in there, which yeah, is cool. Um, we just spent the whole day and we ended up at a cabana square, and then, yeah, it was cool. Nice. And has anyone else had anything? I took my girlfriend on our first date to a drag queen show, and that was really good. Cool. So something that's slightly different, a bit quirky, not necessarily meal and wine for two. Cool. Um, so I'm going to try and not waffle on too much, so apologies in advance if I, if I do, I probably will. Um, but I want to talk to you about date makers, what it is we've been grafting on for the last few years. But I want to talk to you about our product from a UX point of view, based on the fact I'm a complete novice in this area. So I'm guessing you might be wondering what date makers is and why I'm even here. So date makers is a marketplace of date experiences for couples to go on a date, whether it's their first date together or dates for people that have been in a long-term relationship. So no, we're not matchmaking apps. We provide a platform of unique date experiences for couples to try something new. Date Makers now showcases over 200 different date ideas in three main cities, Bristol, Brighton, and London. We have a presence in 10 UK cities, but as we're only a team of two, we're chipping away city by city. So I think the next city will be Manchester. A little secret. Um, <laughs> So for those in relationships, we're a date planning tool. And for those who are single and using matchmaking apps, we are the final stage from online match to offline date. 
And as we're not matchmakers, but all of our data experiences are tailored for two people, we are uniquely geared up to partner with dating apps further down the line. Datemaker's aim is to maintain healthy relationships by encouraging regular date nights, away from the kids and away from the distractions of everyday life. And as, I, as I've said time and time again, our real aim is, to get, is for couples to create great memories. So Datemaker sits um, right in the middle of the dating and the experience market, which are both huge and continuing to grow. Our aim is to become the authoritative voice in the date experience market, changing the landscape of first dates, whilst also, which is our current focus, encouraging couples to try new things together. I actually went to, um, I went to an event last week, which was about Gen Z, so people who were born in between 1995 and 2015, and the experience economy in the future. This was hosted by Full Fat, who um, are a festival PR agency, so they gave me some research, and I can give you guys it after if you're interested. Um, what they've said is that there are five types of experiences they see growing with Gen Zers. These are their five top predictions for the experience economy and the different types of experiences they think will grow with Gen Zers. So the first one, number one, was low-key experiences. So intimate, low-key experiences to kick back with friends. The second one is fluid flows. So ones that you kind of can rock up, leave when you want. There's no real commitment for the cool guys. Um, third one was purposeful pleasure, so purpose-led experiences. The fourth one was future-driven collectives, so experiences that can help you take control of your future. The last one, which I'm not so sure about, is anti-Insta experience. So social media apparently isn't as important as we think. This generation cares more about being in the moment than posting on social media. I'm unconvinced, <laughs> but they've done some research, so we'll see how it goes. I've got, I've got, uh, I can email you some, some of their research as well if you're interested. Um, so singles spend £2.5 billion pounds each year on dating activities. This is an old fact, but I found it online. Might not be true, might be. Take it with a pinch of salt. Um, in 2015, Hinge users, for those that don't know, Hinge is a, is a dating app, um, and they were allegedly going on 35,000 dates a week with only 1,500 relationships forming from those dates. So that's quite a lot of unsuccessful dates. And there's also two facts I learned about fin uh, Tinder, which I read online. Again, I'm not 100% sure on the source of them, so please take these figures with a pinch of salt as well. The average person logs into Tinder 11 times a day. Look at the person using Tinder. Um, another one is there are over 50 million people using Tinder and 1.6 billion swipes happen daily. That's a lot of thumb motion. <laughs> so couples go on dates throughout their uh, dating lives to develop, grow, and sustain their relationship. So this is from early courtship, so like first dates, early days when you're all excited, all the way through to the later years, date nights, away from the kids that has to be scheduled weeks in advance. As such, the market is huge as people are always going on dates. But sadly, the options for couples are dominated by the traditional leisure industry, cinema or your local chain restaurant, resulting in very little uh, or no consumer choice. One critical element of the market is first and early dates, which we don't really focus on at the moment. We have more couples. Um, and whilst there are more than 1,400 matchmaking apps in the UK alone, there are little to no tools for organising offline dates once an online match has been made. So regardless of relationship status, two common problems prevail when wanting to arrange a great date. There's discovery, so there's a lack of date night inspiration, identifying novel date ideas, and then making that idea actually happen. Um, then there's effort. It can sometimes be time consuming and annoying having to organize new and original dates. Basically, if you work eight to eight, you're not gonna have a lot of time to actually think about this. So what we've done is we've um, created a platform where couples can discover and book unique date ideas tailored for two. What we've done is we've, uh, we connect the couples who are looking for these interesting dates in their city with businesses and individuals who can create and host amazing bespoke date experiences. So it's obvious what we do for couples, 
For businesses, we provide a cost-effective marketing channel to specifically target the dating market with bespoke offers for couples and in doing so, um, enabling them to reach new customers. And then for the matchmakers and the dating apps, we can provide a supply, of net, net, uh, a supply network of date experiences that can be used by their users. So that's date makers, sorry for rambling on, but kind of wanted to set the scene a bit. Um, we've been operating incredibly leanly for the last year and a half, and all of what we've done has been completed with an MVP website. So it's been really enjoyable, hard work, but it's been great to get the concept off the ground. And we can't wait to see like, how it progresses this year. Now we know we have a clear focus. So our primary aim last year with our MVP was to test our assumptions, assumptions that there actually was a demand from couples to book dates via our platform and that we are solving a problem. Basically, like people wanted to find unique date ideas in their city. It turned out to work quite well. Um, in our best month last year, we exceeded 350 bookings, which is great because people were putting up with our archaic website. Um, and we're only a team of two, so we're pretty happy with that. Um, we then set out to see if we could launch in our second city, uh, a new city remotely, um, as we wanted to prove that we could roll out the supply side of the business in a scalable way. So we're from, I'm from Bristol, by the way, and we decided to launch in, in Brighton. Um, so we made a hit list of date ideas that we wanted to approach in a second city. And then we launched uh, Date Makers in Brighton in around two weeks. Um, and it was essential we kept this really straightforward and just build strong relationships with the businesses because the product will change, it will evolve, but you want to make sure that they're committed to us and committed to um, the cause and then they'll put up with the crappy product. So as our product development has been very much based on an iteration from an MVP to something that's a bit more slick now um, and of course based heavily on feedback from users and where a lot of things have gone wrong over the last year. Um, but that's kind of how it goes. I've got, I've got some examples of how we've improved our offering for our users based on feedback and on ways we feel as though we've improved conversion and engagement. Um, because we're a two-man team, the UX and design does come under our jurisdiction, which is pretty comical because we don't really know much. Um, but I thought it'd be interesting for you guys to just kind of see what I've learned from a novice. Um, so emails, email notifications, it's how lots of people communicate with their customers. As I'm sure you're all much more aware than I am, email notifications are an extremely powerful method to encourage user engagement. If links are broken or the email itself has conflicting messages, you're unlikely to get what you want out of the email. Through voice and visual design, you can have a huge impact on the user impression of your product. So we found out the hard way, of course, as you always do, as a founder of a small business, because links were broken, the email messaging didn't really make sense, um, which meant that people were kind of ignoring the emails. So we've learned that less really is more. And if you want to get someone to act based on an email, make it short, sweet, succinct, and with a clear call to action. One thing we found quite hard actually is finding a subject line that encourages readers to actually act. So even if right, we found, let's write urgent in the subject line, people will actually might click on it. They didn't. Um, so yeah, there's a few examples of our current emails, just really simple. This is done by Matt and myself, so we kind of hacked it together and they change regularly based on how things go. Before we had broken links and yeah, it's quite embarrassing, so I'm not gonna show you, but. Um, these are the current ones. So the next thing I wanted to talk to you about, um, and I'm sure it's a topic that a lot of you know a lot about, and maybe something we could have a chat about after over a beer, um, and that's user onboarding. And in my opinion, if you have a slick onboarding process, your user engagement further down the line will be considerably higher than if they're onboarded badly. So if they're onboarded efficiently, then they're probably bought into the product and what you're offering, and they can actually see that it will add value to your life, to their lives. So and as our business is a two-sided marketplace, we have customers who book the dates, and then businesses, business owners or individuals who then host the dates. So all the date hosts on the site 
need to be approached and then onboarded onto the site in as little steps as possible. Um, as they're small business owners as well, so they, need, they don't have much time. So our process now is as, as efficient as it's ever been, but I'm really looking forward to this year to see how, how it evolves. So there's three things I've, I've kind of like learned, probably straightforward to you, but I think it's still interesting. Um, firstly, remove all the barriers to entry. Don't make it hard for someone to join the platform. A question I asked a lot, I get asked a lot. I talk to lots and lots and lots and lots of small businesses every week because I'm trying to get them onto the platform. They say, cool, I like the idea, now what? And I'm scrambling around trying to find the answers and find out where we are in the, in the, in the sales funnel. Um, people agree to sign the business up, but they want to know the next steps. They want the next steps to be quick and as easy as possible. Otherwise, they're just not going to bother. Um, and also, they'll be unsure of what's expected of them. Or even worse, what I find is people get quite frustrated at is when they think they're done and then they're given another task to complete. Um, I now try to get all the essentials done in one, one, uh, one sweep. The next one is you really want to motivate the, your users to finish the task that you've asked them to do. Um, for startup founders, and that's kind of where I come from, I, my background is sailing um, university, so I don't have much experience, but from a startup founder's point of view, everything always wants, to, you want it to be urgent, it needs to be urgent, because you want to see results quickly, and you can't really waste time chasing people up because you've got a million and one things going on. But sharing this urgency can sometimes be tricky uh, because you don't want to be annoying, and I'm often really, really annoying. Um, an option to encourage fast sign up, we haven't done this, but I've kind of read about it and learned about it, is you can offer incentives for faster signups. We haven't done it, might explore it, might not. Um, I wrote transparency here because I think it's really important to let users know how much time is left and how much more is expected of them, um, how many more steps there is to complete. And you want to be really crystal clear from the start because I'm sure, as you all know, you get many, many, many drop-offs after that. Lastly, um, a quick product tour. I found out the hard way as, as, as ever. Um, so much time goes into getting them live on the site, chasing them, calling them, even finding them in the first place. When it comes to actually using the product, you want them to know how to use it. And if you're relying on them to act, um, use the product like we are, so accept, it's for them to accept a date request, they really want to know how to use it. Um, we've had it where we've had bookings worth quite a lot of money and they've been ignored because the person hasn't been taught well enough by us, so it's kind of down to us to like teach them, um, even though it's quite obvious, but it should still teach them. So that's the onboarding. Um, I now wanted to talk to you about our call to actions that we had on our page and I thought it might be interesting for you guys. Um, I'd like to know how many of you have worked with startups before. I mean, I like startups that haven't gone through like three or four rounds of funding. I mean, startups with founders who are like, can't pay their groceries and stuff. <laughs> cool, about the same. Um, so there, that's me. One of the startups are kind of struggling to pay for groceries and stuff. These founders, they're the ones that are really keen to hack something together because um, they have ideas that are keeping, up, keeping them up at night. They want to hack an idea together because they want to see it live. They want to test the assumptions that it makes sense. Um, so something that Matt and I have done, who's my friend from school and now my business partner, which sounds weird, but he is, um, we wanted to incentivize our users to book their first date. And we also wanted to encourage peer-to-peer -peer referrals and also sell gift cards. Um, we couldn't do that on the site. We had one button to request a book. We had to then build another button that was said, enter my code here. So we basically had two buttons on the same page, which was really confusing. Um, we finally got something live, but at the cost of it being really, really confusing. And as I said, having two call to actions. I, I, I could only find a mobile version. The, the desktop, top, desktop one was way uglier, so I'm glad I found this one. But as you can see, it's quite confusing. You've got two buttons there. Often people would click on the request to book button and think they were doing the right thing, but they weren't. It's not their fault, but that's just how it goes. Um, so yeah, we had the big ugly button there, which said redeem my code. 
this is quite funny because we just wanted to get something live and test the fact that test that people would use credit uh, use credit towards their dates. Um, so this, yeah, so we would then, so someone would click on the redeem my code button then we do all the work in the background to get things sorted. So they click on that redeem my code button and then the booking itself wouldn't actually happen on our main website. This is a bit of a nightmare because we couldn't really track conversions, order value and well, like pretty much everything as I'm sure you can imagine. But if you're on a limited budget and you want to test an assumption and then iterate, sometimes you have to hack things together to move things forward. So I don't want to speak on behalf of all founders um, because it's not true, but some might be willing, us in this case, willing to sacri sacrifice a good user experience so they can continue to test their assumptions. You'll be glad to know we've now changed it so that it's all in one flow, um, which for us is quite a big win. It took quite a lot of time to do that because we're non-technical. Um, so we have a nice clean space for users to enter their gift cards gift card codes and referral codes, which is great. So we've now, um, we've now fixed our main problems for now. Um, and I actually wanted to call on the audience, you guys, for some suggestions on our next problem that I see happening. Um, if it, you don't have a short answer, we can chat after, that's fine. But now we're scaling up, um, I'd like to ask you guys if you have any ideas on how we could filter and display all of our data ideas as we scale. So one big problem we're going to face is how we filter the search, the searches across lots of different cities and different categories. So we've got four main categories. We've got food, drink, creative and active, and a list of cities that's growing really quickly. So users go to the website, they then have loads of stuff going on. They have a thing in Newcastle when they're from Brighton. I'm interested to see if anyone's got any quick fire suggestions on how they would do that. If there's no quick fire question uh, answers, that's fine. We can catch up after. Find a similar app and shamelessly copy them. Shamelessly copy, <laughs> that's I like the that. Way to do it. Write that down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's a good one. If the website knows their location, then there is uh, one filter down. Yeah. Mm. I would. Um, Look at competitor analysis, look at other industries, how they do the filter mm -hmm. research. But even if you're asking some of these people, you should also test with users and not just put it out live and see if it works or not, because you could be damaging your reputation as yeah. well. Um, just create some tasks, give it to one of your friends or whoever, and say, okay, you need to filter this, how would you go about doing that? and see what they do. Because at the moment we've got cities, but people don't always see that it says pick your city at the top, but it's not maybe that obvious. Um, I agree with what you said. Yeah. And, um, what pops into my head is something like popular in your area, like what other people really like to do in London, for example. Or, um, so like, the, the, what, like things that people are already doing. And, yeah. yeah, yeah. What, what's popular at the moment? Look, yeah, look at Deliveroo, uh, yeah. because they do Flip City. Advisor, even, maybe? Yeah, mm. something like that. Then just look at dating, look at other industries. Um, but don't copy them, because it might not work for you. A little bit. Because they don't copy Airbnb, yeah, yeah, yeah. because it's yeah. the best host place or whatever. It might not work for you. Yeah. So I would test it, don't put it live, because you could be damaging reputation as well. Cheers. Do some sort of like quiz, like a little like a few kind of quiz, and then it would like filter. Like the first question would be, Where are you based? And yeah, yeah. filter all the way to like a tailored date for you. And then it's just, yeah, unique, just relevant for them. Yeah, that's no, good. Thank you. I think it's important to first start at the basis of understanding what your users want to see. Yeah. If it's someone coming in and wants a date tonight, mm -hmm. they'll probably want to be able to filter. That's it, spontaneous tonight. stuff. Yeah. Versus you know, next week or next Saturday. Because the truth is there could be so many different filters that we could do. So I have it's the same struggle. Yeah. I'm a product manager for the search yeah, yeah. product in my company right now and I don't know how to define relevancy. I don't know how to find a baseline for it. I'm struggling with the green panel. So yeah. um, I think asking people is one part of it, but also maybe using data science models, mm. getting AI involved, um, and they're not just buzzwords. You know, you could really get the data, that, get, get the raw data, and then find the patterns, and then change your filtering panel and make sure it is based off that. 
Yeah, because I think that one of the options was to have um, on the home page grids with panels with the cities that the users are on. But I mean, there's lots of, yeah, there's so many options. But when you're testing it, if you're asking people um, what they're thinking while they're doing it, yeah. um, the, what their, their expectations are and what mm. they expect to see when they're, when they're sort of clicking. And then listening to their feedback yeah. rather than just scrolling yeah. down. Yeah. yeah. I'll move on, but I'll maybe chat to anyone that wants to talk about it after or like via email. We're happy to talk to you. Thanks very much. Um, so as I'm sure you've gathered, um, Matt and I, Matt's my business partner who's not here tonight. Um, we don't have a huge amount of experience in design or UX, but we do often look to various tools to get us to help us get the job done. Um, for example, I've been using a, uh, a tool recently called Smart Mockups. Um, it's really basic, but I've really enjoyed it. Um, you can basically, um, and I'm sure you use something very similar or you don't, but it's great because you can design your product or logo in situ uh, to make it look great when presenting to people. And it's been good for us for recent pitch decks, trying to raise investment and some design work as well. Um, but yeah, so if you haven't used Smart Markets, you can. And I tell you what though, I've, I've kind of got, I kind of got carried away. <laughs> like, like really carried away. Like really, really, really carried away. So yeah. What I'm trying to say is, if you, we try and use as many tools as possible. Um, if you haven't used, have you, if you haven't used smart mockups, use it. It's it's, it's great. And I got carried away last night. Um, it's wrapping up now. I suppose there are three main takeaways from my talk. Um, Firstly, and the most important one, is maintaining healthy relationships is just as important as starting them, if not more important. Uh, secondly, working with young founders on products can be rewarding, I'm sure. <laughs> um, lastly, would be to expect the unexpected. You can put a whole load of work into getting a product live and then you can get let down by something totally out of the blue. Just like I did driving a ukulele instructor all the way around Bristol after all the work we put into the website. <laughs> so thank you. I actually wanted to finish on this slide. What's the bravest thing you, uh, you've ever said? Asked the boy. Help, said the horse. If anyone's ever like struggling, workload, relationships, try and talk to someone because quite important and it take a weight off of your chest once you actually talk about it so yeah thanks a lot time nice